So our readings today are quite serious, so is our gospel as regards sin and conversion. And it's a topic that's not very popular these days to talk about sin, but sin exists, sin exists. I mean, you you read the newspapers, look at any of your news feeds, sin exists, (coughs) and we do it. Uh, We're guilty of it. Uh, It would be, I think, uh, a a problem, Uh, it would be wrong to think that um, the cross, Jesus dying on the cross was caused by all them other sinners out there, and never to actually look at the fact that I've been forgiven too. Uh, my impatience, my uh, anger, my lust, my whatever it is, my pride, that has, if I have confessed it, that has been forgiven too. So the Lord has paid for for my debt. I was thinking during the week of one particular saint, uh, her name is Margaret of Cortona. Um, She's got a very interesting story. She's from a 13th century uh, saint from Italy, uh, a place called um, near, uh, it's up in Tuscany, okay. So there was an awful lot of civil unrest there. F- uh, families fighting against families, sitting in cities against cities, all sorts of revenge and vendetta and all this crazy stuff going on. So she lived in a very tumultuous uh, time of history. So born into a modest background, uh, her dad just had a you know, very simple holding, a very simple house, and uh, she happened to be quite attractive. So from a young age, she recognized, she realized that she could actually get a guy's attention very easily and manipulate him. So she would stand there in the main street uh, in the town and just kind of smile at the the, the riders as they'd pass by and they'd they'd stop their horses and uh, chatter up, basically, in modern terms. Uh, So this was all good, but then she started to kind of give in to that as well and maybe even live a free lifestyle. And what I was actually horrified by was this all happened before she was the age of 17. So there was then a lot of different gentlemen and sleeping around and all this kind of stuff. And uh, her parents tried to reel her in, but her dad was uh, sometimes permissive and sometimes too strict altogether, uh, sometimes violent and sometimes she go on. Uh, but then she started to get a reputation around the place and in the neighboring villages as well, that she was just this, this free living lady. Okay, so her mom died, replaced by her stepmom. Mom, her dad remarried, and the stepmom mom then tried to clamp down on her altogether. But this had the opposite effect on Margaret and drove her away. Margaret heard about a landowner in a place called Multipulciano, and who was looking for a maid in his house. So off she goes with him, and she recognizes while she's serving there in the house that he's always paying her compliments. That he's he always kind of has his eye on her. She knows that she has him wrapped around her little finger. And she liked him also. It was pretty obvious that he liked her, but she also liked him. So between the jigs and the reels, uh, they got together and ended up having a child, much, again, to the horror of her family. And, of course, this man wasn't married to her. She was of simple background. He was of noble background. He would never marry her. So it would be scandalous to marry her, even more scandalous than having her as his bit on the side. Okay. He goes off to a hunting expedition and after a couple of days there's no sign of him but then his faithful hound comes back comes back into the into the castle there in multiple channel and she knows she sees margaret knows there's something wrong he he, why would the dog come back without him the dog seems upset as much as a dog can and uh, so she fought she follows the dog and the dog goes back out into the forest a good trek away and there's her husband lying dead. Sorry, her husband, her boyfriend, partner type person, uh, lying dead there in the forest, uh, dead for a couple of days by the look of things. So she gets this rude awakening. What have I done with my life? What has he done with his life? You know, we've been engaging in these acts outside of marriage, and, and now he's dead. How is his soul actually before God? And if I were to die, how is my soul before God? I've led men into sin. I've led married men into sin. Uh, she, 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 she was just devastated by the thought that she had lived her life in this, in this horrific way. She had actually also had a child by this man. So uh, what, what am I to do? Her life just seemed like an absolute mess at this point. So she decided to go home to this father who had loved her and yet had, I suppose, been somewhat permissive. But when she went home, while she was welcomed initially by him, the mother-in-law wouldn't have much of it. And 
this coupled with the fact that she, since she had sinned publicly, she wanted to do penance publicly. So she wanted to go out into the public squares and say, I did this and I'm wrong, much to the embarrassment of her family. Okay, so her mother-in-law and her dad ended up kicking her out, so she went to the Franciscans. And there she starts to have a deep conversion and uh, a deep realization of who she is and of her dignity before God. Okay, I have to fast forward now through to the end of the story. She becomes a sister and a saint and actually has mystical experiences meeting the Lord, okay, conversing with the Lord. And the Lord shows her on one occasion her place in heaven. And she said, Lord, how can you have this place prepared for me after all I've done? He said, not only have I prepared you a place in heaven, I have prepared you a place among the virgins. Why do I tell this? When the Lord looks at us, there is always a way back. There is always redemption. There is always healing if we want it. And so as for all of you watching us today on this Mass, if there's anything that separates our heart from his, if there's any obstacle, if there's any sin, if there's any, anything that, that's there that should not be there, let us root it out now. Let us find our way back to the Lord who is full of mercy and compassion.